How's everybody feeling today? Well, uh, this morning, um, I'm excited to share this message. It really is foundational uh, for for this ministry and the journey we've been on. Um, but it really is foundational for all who profess the name of Jesus, and uh, and I do say all. So, so I think the, a type of message like this, some people try to get out of it because <laughs> it might not be the most convenient or um, even, in, in a sense, the most comforting message, even though it really is if you look into it. Um, but it stretches us. It stretches us out of our selfishness and uh, into a place of actually profound blessing. But it, it comes about in a way that I think uh, to, the, to the world system would seem kind of backwards, like the way the world operates. So uh, this is, I'm going to take you through a journey of some scriptures. And, uh, um, and so are you ready for the title? So we're, here's what it's going to be about. You ready for this? We're going to talk about two things, and we'll see if I can get it done in, in one, one morning, or if not, we'll, we'll break it up to two parts. But um, so the first part, we're going to talk about the exceedingly great benefits and rewards of serving the poor. Okay? And we're going to see that. And a lot of this is just straight up Bible. This is literally the inspiration that started this whole journey in this ministry was just reading the Bible and going, you know what? I think we better take this serious, <laughs> especially in this life. So we'll talk about that. And then the flip side of the same type of theme is the unimaginable consequences and calamities of not serving the poor. Okay, you all ready for this? So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to dive deep into your word and for you to speak to our hearts and change us, challenge us, make us like you. Lord, we just thank you that in this life, Lord, there, there are plenty of opportunities to, to be Jesus to so many hurting people, broken people, addicted people. They're all around us, God, and, and uh, Lord, you give us opportunity to be the light, to be the salt to be the comfort, to be helping hands, healing hands. Lord, we just ask you that you would inspire us and change us, challenge us by your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first we'll just, um, actually, before I go there, let's, let's stand for the reading of God's word. I just, now, there's 3,000, someone say 3,000, 3, scriptures that deal with the poor, with widows, with orphans. Uh, with you know that all deal with mercy, justice, compassion. So it's really a major. Someone say major, major, major theme all through the scriptures. Um, sometimes in our Western world, I think we've missed a lot of it. I think we're getting better as the decades roll on. Uh, but we're going to look at these these passages. Let's start with the first one. I just picked out a few out of the multitudes, uh, and you, these are ones you're not really going to see hanging on your refrigerator very much, but. I think, they're prof- I think they're profound if, uh, if you see what it is. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them will receive many curses. Okay, let that sink in for a moment. How many people would rather be in the first category? I thought so. Okay, let's go to the next scripture. Okay. Okay. Um, if a man shuts his ears to the cries of the poor, he too will cry out and will not be answered. Or this, this is a little different here. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and will not be answered. Kind of sobering scriptures. And the last one we're going to read is the words of Jesus himself. In the Beatitudes, he starts off and he says, bless, sorry, I'm, I went to the wrong one. This is the one, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The words of Jesus. He also says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. How many people want to be shown mercy? Yeah. Well, he shows us how to, how to do it right there. 
Let's, let's be seated in the presence of the Lord and let's dive in. You ready for this? Okay. So, um, now, when we, when we look at the, at the world right now, you see all kinds of, you know, calamities and urgencies and, you know, humans are crying out and, you know, contending against one another and a lot of offended people. We just see this atmosphere, this uproar. Um, and uh, I feel like we, uh, we need to be able to, to, to know our role, our place in, in, in this life because there's a lot of political rhetoric. There's a lot of things that are trying to pull us this way, that way. And I'll tell you, a lot of times, especially in political circles, people use the poor or use this compassion, but sometimes it's a pseudo-compassion. It's all, it's all, you can see even through scriptures that uh, people, uh, the attorneys come to Jesus and they, well, who's my neighbor? And they're trying, everyone's trying to use this, this compassion thing uh, as, as uh, p- political, as, well, who's right, who's wrong, this whole thing. But let's just forget all of that, the way the world's trying to digest it, you know, immigration, everything, all these things. Uh, and let's just go straight to the scripture and let's see our role as believers, those who profess the, na- in the name of Jesus. Does that sound good? Yeah. So that's what we want to do. We want to go right there and get the, the, to the pure source, not the distorted source where everyone's just using people, da- down and out and broken people uh, for their own agendas because it really can happen. It's kind of sad. And, uh, and, and the other thing that we need to set aside in, in such an atmosphere that we're in right now in, a, in America and in the nations, even Europe's dealing with all these things, uh, is um, politics is different than the church. A lot of people try to put the two together. They're two different roles. And every time we mix them up, we get all mad and messed up. Uh, the, we, we want our politicians to be compassionate and, and justice, right? And, and we want, they're not exempt from the basics of the kingdom. No one is. Uh, we want that. But there's a different role that they play than the, than the role of the church. Yeah. And when we get those mixed up, it's just a mumble jumble. It's confusion. Everyone's mad at everyone. Well, you should be doing this. and You should be doing that. I want to go straight to the role of the body of Christ. Our, our privilege, I call it the privilege of the body of Christ, is to serve the poor. And, uh, and, and one of the greatest opportunities we have to see the kingdom advance. So it's, it's, if, you, if you're a fisherman, you've got to know where the good fishing spots are. It's my, that's my fishing hole right there. That's where the fish bite, right? And, and, and a lot of times we've, I grew up, my backdrop, my decades of life, I'm 50, uh, almost 54. And I grew up in, in an era where much of the church was, was moving out, out of the inner cities, out of the cities even, and moving to suburbs. And, uh, you know, kind of in, in essence, whether you admit it or not, catering to the rich. More comfortable places, more, you know, better offerings, you know, better. And, and, uh, and so, but I believe we're in a day right now where the church is getting ready to run right back in. They're going to get a spirit of mercy and justice and compassion and uh, it'll no longer be the days of the love of most growing cold and then suffering the results, suffering uh, what we've seen in our cities and in our culture, because we, we as believers have the privilege of extending the love of Jesus, especially uh, to the most vulnerable. Yeah, God has a special heart for the broken. You can see these type of scriptures we just read and go, wait a second, those who serve the poor will lack nothing? I mean, he doesn't say that about any other category of people. So let's, let's dive in. You ready for this? Um, so I'm going to skip a few things here, but uh, um, so I have way too much. Actually, this could be a whole book, really, eventually, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we've grown up in a, in a culture, got to understand, in the, in the Western culture, it's very much driven by materialism, you know, the, the American dream, you know, get, get, get the house and the, a couple cars or, you know, whatever, you know, and all, all the kind of the, the prototype of what success and blessing looks like. And, uh, and I, I just want to say that God calls us to walk in mercy, not materialism, okay? And there's a big difference, uh, God wants you to be blessed. He actually gives us, through looking at some of these scripture, scriptures that talk about compassion, we see that, man, some of the most profound blessings are going to be found uh, by those who actually walk out 
what we're going to talk about here. So let's jump right in to um, the exceeding, exceedingly great benefits and rewards of serving the poor, okay? So first of all, let's talk about a benefit. Anyone interested in benefits? Okay. Uh, something that promotes well-being, that gives you an advantage. If you've got benefits, you've got advantage. You've got well-being. Um, and, and so... Um, this is something I think we should all, especially when the benefits come from the Lord. That means they don't wear out, right? That means this is, this is not stuff that can be stolen and ripped off. These are the benefits that the Lord adds to us. So we're going to jump into that and the rewards. All through the scripture we see that we're rewarded for what we do or uh, we suffer the consequence of what we do not do. Okay, so both um, are important uh, to understand that God does reward um, he does give, and um, he wants to bless us. He wants to set us up for success. He wants us to receive the benefits. So when we begin to be compassionate and, and full of mercy, uh, we begin to become something. One of the benefits is we become, according to Scripture, and we'll, we'll dive into this, we become authentic. We become an authentic believer. There's, there's Christians, and then there's practicing Christians. Anyone can be in name only. Well, I'm Christian. Yeah, I'm cool like that. You know, I mean, even in, even in the inner city, all the years that we were in the hood here, everyone was kind of cool with Jesus. Oh, I'm, I'm down with Jesus. He's cool, you know. But those who are actually living it and walking in righteousness, sometimes there's few, few to be found. Right? And so, so we become authentic. What does authentic mean? Um, it means uh, worthy of acceptance or belief. Uh, worthy uh, of acceptance because of, watch this, accuracy. We become believable. We become uh, the real thing, as people would say, okay? How many people want to be authentic? Yeah. Of course we do, you know? And, and there's stern warnings, extensive warnings all through Scripture about, about being hypocrites, uh, about the Pharisees who were hypocrites. So we go in here and we look at this. Uh, it's, uh, it's the state of not being false but, uh, or even an imitation, but being the real thing, Okay? Being true to one's personality or spirit or character. Now, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, then, then we need to be true to his character and his attributes. And he's full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay? Now, we can see <clears throat> the apostles. Let's just start, start with this. If, if you remember... Uh, those who became apostles, first they were disciples and they walked with Jesus and they did three years of ministry with him and they had their ups and downs, they had their issues, right? Uh, but after, after the cross, after the resurrection, we see um, that the apostles um, were doing something that I think is quite shocking to our Western way of doing church. We see that they were, they were serving the poor, they were serving the widows, uh, like with their own hands and their own time and their own energy and you know, I don't know where they got the food, but, uh, you know, they were, that's what they were doing. You know, we don't talk about that much. Now we talk about the, the great apostles' teachings and writings and, and, uh, and the miracles and signs and wonders that all came from their hands. But we see to the point that they, you can read about it in the book of Acts. I won't be able to, uh, to give you every um, scripture, but this is the early chapters of the book of Acts. It says that they, got, they came to a place, the apostles, where they were just like, Oh, this is overwhelming, you know. We're doing the Mana Cafe, right? We're do, you know, they're, they're, to the point where they didn't have any time for prayer uh, or teaching of the Word. So basically, now people don't just fall into that after you've walked with Jesus. Somehow they saw that priority modeled, and then when Jesus left them the authority to carry on the work of the, of the ministry, uh, they... They started doing that. Now, what did they do? They said, well, we need more people. We need more leaders. So they got Stephen and the boys, as I call them, the next realm of leaders. They prayed about it. said, who do we get? And they gathered those guys and the people of good character and wisdom and full of the spirit so that they can serve the poor. So that they put their hands on these guys and ordained them and said, now you guys wait tables. You guys carry it on. Isn't that interesting? Now, we don't, we don't hear that much in, in today's time. We hear about the apostles 
teaching and the miracles and all the big stuff that's happening. But there was a foundational compassion that was in the early church. Okay? Now, uh, Cassie mentioned it, which I thought was cool, uh, about Cornelius. This was my next thing. We see the the very first um, uh, Gentile who receives the Holy Spirit. How many people want to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit was attracted out of all the people he could have went to, to one particular guy. We heard about the attributes of this amazing man who was a centurion uh, in the Italian regiment. And it says, he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. They didn't know Jesus yet, uh, but they were God-fearing, and they gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly, okay? And, and then the angel of the Lord um, uh, comes and, and highlights Cornelius, and the, angel, and the angel answers, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So basically he's saying, hey, we chose you. Why? Because of your prayer life, your secret life, and your outer life, extending all that goodness that's, that, that we generate sometimes when we're, when we're uh, focusing on God and getting filled with the Spirit. And, and uh, he says, he says um, that this has come up as a memorial uh, that God remembers. God remembers your gifts. Therefore, here comes the Holy Spirit, first man First Gentile to receive the Holy Spirit. So I believe that's the foundation of the Gentile church, should be. A prayer life, a secret life, and a, and a, a, a compassionate life, uh, giving generously. Now, let's keep moving there. Does that sound good? Yeah. So we see that. So the second thing you're, attribute you're going to get if you serve the poor uh, is you become authoritative. In other words, you have authority. Okay? How many people would like to have authority? Yes. Remember, Jesus... Uh, the, the people were astonished at his teaching because he wasn't like the teachers of the law. He wasn't like everyone else that were, were, that were leading the charge in the church, uh, in the temples. And the, uh, he says when he taught uh, his word, uh, his, for his word was with authority, it says. There was weight behind it. The people took note and were like, wait a second. This guy's different. He's coming from a whole different place, okay? Now, I noticed... Uh, in studying church history and just watching what was happening and how the church, I'm always fascinated how the church impacts culture and society or lack thereof or doesn't and wonder what's going wrong. Why? And so one of the, the people that I, that I watched growing up was Mother Teresa, okay? And, and just seeing how she began to serve the poor. Now, remember, she, she, she was like 98, I think, Romanian. I think, I think she's from Romania, but 98 pound little nun who served in obscurity for many, many years, okay? Uh, And no one even celebrated or knew her name, but she began to serve the poor, the poorest of the poor. And uh, I've had friends that actually met her and spent time with her. And, uh, um, but it's fascinating. She goes to to, to people, primarily in India, they they branched out all across the world over time, but uh, people that were really destined to die, and just so a lot of times just gave them uh, love and care and compassion and a dignified death because they were so far gone. But they, she poured out love and mercy and, shot, and showed value to people that mostly would just try to avoid, walk on the other side of the street, step over, you know, or, or even run for your life. Man, let's get out of this, this part of town. And, and so she went right there. She took a vow of poverty. It's, it's kind of, it can seem a little extreme, but when you, when you look at what were the, what were the results... What were the results? Well, she got to a place where, where uh, any king or politician, president would love to have their picture taken beside her. Like, are you kidding me? You know, how does that happen? How does uh, she get invited of all the people to the uh, presidential prayer breakfast when President Clinton was in and, and, and has the authority? Watch this. We're talking about authority. Uh, a, a little woman who serves the, the nobodies, that's what most people would say, the untouchables for in obscurity for years, and then eventually people start to take note. Um, how does she get to go to a, a prayer breakfast and speak before all the dignitaries, all the, all the officials, and, and, uh, and the president himself? And, 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 and actually, what does she do? She rebukes him. She, she comes up right in front of everybody's face and says, abortion is murder. And, 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 and she says, give me the babies. Guess what people did? 
Absolutely nothing. Who's going to touch that? When someone actually lives it, she had such authority, like, I'm not touching. Standing ovation. Standing ovation. She goes out. She has the authority to deal with stuff like that. And because why? She's believable. She's believable. And they're, they're like, wow. So let's keep going here on scripture here. Uh, let's talk about John the Baptist. Um, now, this is important because all through the Bible, you can see that the prophets were the champions for the poor. You, actually, if you did a study, Old Testament, you can pretty much go through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, I mean, Micah, all of them, you go, wow, they dealt with uh, idolatry, immorality, and injustice to the poor. That's the primary things that they were, they were uh, warning and, and, um, and you know, rebuking Israel when they had fallen into apostasy, when they fall away from the ways of the Lord. You see it time and time again. So you, someone would say, well, new covenant, things change, you know. Well, let's take a look at uh, the, the prophet John who prepare the way of the Lord. So he's the one who's making way for Jesus, the Messiah, to, to come. Let's see what he says here. Let's, let's look at this. John chapter 3, verse 7. If you want to go there, John 3, verse 7. John said to the, to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Wow, what a way to open a, <laughs> a sermon. <laughs> okay? And they're, and they're coming out to the desert to see him. And he, this is his opening line, at least that we see. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, I'll skip this part for a minute here, and I'll go to verse 9, it says, um, he says, the axe is already at, at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire, okay? So he's basically saying, you're fixing to be judged. The axe is already at the root of your tree, you know, warning. And, he said, and, the, and the interesting thing is after being called a bunch of snakes with no fruit, getting ready to be thrown into the fire, uh, instead of the people being offended, they asked a very important question. They could have just left right there. Like, you kidding me? I came out here for this, All right? And, uh, and, and, he said, and they say this. They said, well, what then should we do? The crowd asks. Like, what are you, what are you trying to get at here? Like, and, and so they asked the question. John answers, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. That's what he's upset about. That's what he's warned. Wait, basic compassion? Now let's read this again. The man who has two tunics should share, and the one who has none, who has food, should do the same. You see what he's saying there? So basically, that's, that's it. And then now the, the tax collectors... <laughs> Also ask, they come up to be baptized, well, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Wow. So here's, here's the, prepare ye the way of the Lord. This is what he's uh, warning about. This is what he's upset about. He says, share and be fair. Wow. Could that be the gospel? <laughs> to love your neighbor as you would want to be loved? And so I found this was, was profound when I started seeing that this, this theme is all through the scripture. It's not as religious as we think it is. It's basic mercy and compassion for one another is what the Lord's after. And when it's missing, there's, there's real consequence, okay? So that's, what, that's, that's all he said. That was, that was his, ment- his message of repentance. <laughs> Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Well, how do we do that? What should we do? Okay, moving on. Verse, uh, or sorry, point number three. When we, when we, the benefit of serving the poor is we become affluent. What? We serve the poor and we become affluent? What does affluent mean? It means to have a generosity sufficient. Sorry, wrong definition. It means flowing. <laughs> it means flowing with abundance. Affluent streams. It means to be fluid. That means God can pour stuff into you, and you're like a conduit that comes out of you. Just flowing, 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 in and out, in and out. A beautiful flow. Y'all seeing that? Yeah. And so he wants you to have abundance. We read that. Um, he who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them will receive many curses. Proverbs 28, verse 27. 
Jesus says this, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth, where, where the moth and rust and destroy, where, where thieves break in and steal. Do not store for yourselves, uh, sorry, I got something written wrong here. Uh, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. And I want to talk to you about one scripture that you can read it yourself, I don't have time to read it, but uh, Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 16, verse 19, okay? It's called The Rich Man and Lazarus. It's an interesting story. You've got to ask yourself, why did he share that? Like, what's that all about? So in this story, in Luke 16, he says there was a, there was a poor beggar who, who sat at the gate of a rich man. Now notice, you get Lazarus' name. Lazarus was the beggar. He's named, okay? He's known. The rich man is just some random rich man, just some rich man. And the only thing we know about the rich man is he never helped Lazarus, who sat at his gate every day begging. He stepped over him. He's like, all, that's all we know about the rich man. He was rich. He did not open his heart to this beggar who was in his path every day. And, and then it flips to eternity, and you, you see that the rich man is in hell, and, and in the agony of the fires of hell, and you, all you know is Lazarus is in heaven. That's it. And, and that's really all the story is. It's like there's a rich guy who did not serve the poor. He's in hell. There's a poor guy who was a nobody on earth, a beggar. He's known. We have his name, and he's in heaven. Just think about that one. So many who, who will be first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So you might look like you're last on earth, but that doesn't necessarily mean how it's going to turn out uh, in eternity. And many who look like they're first in this realm will end up being last or even left out in the next realm. I know some of this is intense. You don't normally hear preaching like this, but y'all, y'all, y'all okay? It's the straight up Bible. It's what got me off my selfish path, self-serving primarily, and to doing things that I never thought I would do. Praise be to God. Okay, point number four, one of the benefits of, uh, and the blessings of serving the poor is you become accepted. Become accepted. Let's look at it. This is one of the foundational scriptures for us. Big time, John 1 John 3.16, the other John 3.16, says, This then is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possession, there it went and got practical again. Now, see that? If anyone has, the first part is nice, and it's like, oh, love, everybody love everybody. But then all of a sudden, boom, like, here we go. Anyone has possession? Sounds like John again, doesn't it? Interesting. Um, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Question mark. Like, wow. How does that work? That's what John's saying. Now, John walked with Jesus, right? It says, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Okay? Now, we're talking about being accepted, okay? Verse 19, this then is how we know that we belong to the truth. And we set our hearts at rest in his presence. This then. He just described how we know we belong and how and we're, we're accepted and we're part of the family of God. And I remember, I'll tell you a story, that I, when I was here in, in Nashville, the early years, and I was uh, doing the you know, music industry stuff, Christian music, and we were traveling all over the world. We were doing concerts and festivals and, and uh, studio stuff and hanging out with a bunch of you know, big names and all that stuff. Uh, we were we were wrestling on the inside. Like something felt so man made about a lot of it. Some of it was good, good people trying to do good things, but we're like, Lord, you know, where are you? Where's your kingdom? As young men, we were crying out, like, we gotta find you, Lord. This is okay. We're doing what we love to do, but we're realizing we don't love it that much. It's like climbing the ladder of success to find out it's leaning on the wrong wall. Like, oh, <laughs> okay, now what? <laughs> So we went back to seeking the Lord, and, and we began to stumble over these scriptures. And we stumbled, literally. We're like, whoa, that's messing up my normal stride of the day, taking care of me and my own self. And I was like, wait, let's, let's look at this again. And we began to see um, some of these scriptures 
and we began to realize, let's try it. Let's just at least do an outreach. Let's do something different, out of the ordinary. And so we did, and uh, we went to, to uh, our very first outreach right down here on Drummondbrim. One of our guys said, man, I know where there's a bunch of homeless guys. We can get them. I got a little grill. We'll get some food, some music. We'll go to the streets. Let's just try it out, see if it works. It's the words of Jesus. It's important to him. Let's make it important to us. So we tried it. And, you know, I don't know if anyone got saved. Maybe I did that night, that first outreach, you know. But um, we were driving home, and I told my friend, man, I said, I just feel like we touched eternity like, like that. I knew that that was pure. I knew that that mattered. So a lot of the other stuff, I didn't know how it added up. It was just a mixture. And, uh, and, and then the Lord said, you know, you just touched me. That's why it feels so good. When you threw the poor, you just touched me. You ministered to me. We'll talk about that scripture in a minute. And then, and then I, this scripture sunk in right here. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. And we set our hearts at rest. It's like the first time in my journey of Nashville, all this big name, fame game, all this stuff going down, and all of a sudden my heart was at rest. And where did I find it? In a, in, with the poor, with the broken people. And I was like, wow, that, this was that that he's talking about. So Matthew 25, this was the, one of the ones that catapulted us into action, from inaction to action. Um, I'll read you just a portion, Matthew 25, verse 33. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. This is the Lord dividing all of mankind into only two categories. Okay? Uh, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed. They're, so remember we're talking about those who are accepted. Come, come in, you're blessed. Uh, you're blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. So all this list of real practical, basic stuff, mercy, compassion. Um, and he says, this is what we're going to talk about on Judgment Day. This is the, the two categories. And, and those who have been d- done what sheep do, the category on the right, uh, he, he, said, he says, you will receive an inheritance. You receive this blessing. Um, so, you know, I was a stranger. You invited me in. Um, I remember a time when, and it, I, this was on my mind because uh, Daniel just told us, I haven't got the whole story yet, but he just was down in Orlando doing a, evangelism, and he's got a, a story where he literally believes he encountered an angel through, through a, a, a poor guy in a very distressing disguise. Uh, and uh, I'll let him tell the story sometime. But the, the guy all of a sudden just turned on the revelation, began to pray and prophesy over him after, like, you know, yeah, it was like he's got it on recording too, the whole recording. And, but it, he had to push through all these, these bizarre things that was happening. And, and, and he asked the guy 10 times, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved? You know, and, and finally the guy said yes, and then boom, boom. And then all of a sudden the guy's prophesying over him like profound stuff. So we'll let him share more of that. But, but it happened to me a few times where we were entertaining strangers, people like just, you know, some guy on the street or something. And I remember a time I was um, um, uh, at McDonald's on Broadway here. I was coming out, and this guy comes to me. He was kind of a Hispanic-looking guy. And he comes, and he smells like alcohol. He's got a bad smell and everything. He's, and he's coming right towards me. And I'm thinking, okay, I got a minute where I can just duck my head and go to my car. Or I can somehow, you know, just receive this guy to some extent, see what he's up to, see what he wants, you know. He's coming right towards me. So I just decide, well, I've been reading the Bible, so maybe I'm going to try some more Bible stuff out. Here we go. And the guy comes up to me, and, uh, um, and he's got, he looks like he was just beat up. He was like literally, his nose was over here, and he was like bleeding, and just, just a total mess. I was like, Lord. And, and uh, I asked him what happened to you. He goes, oh, it's just rough on the streets out here, you know. And uh, I said, well, do you, do you need some lunch or something? Is that? So I, I go, he goes, yeah, I'd like that. I go in and get him a couple hamburgers, give him a little bat bag here you go and and then and then he, all of a sudden he just shifts from this distressing disguise to saying he pulls out this wallet and he says and he's got this tattered picture of Jesus he said this has been in my wallet since I was a young man 
and it's just, he pulls up this Jesus, and he goes, he points on Broadway there, and there's all these, you know, BMWs and everyone driving up and down and everything. And he says, you see, you see all these folks out here? He goes, most of them have forgot. They got an appointment with him. Most of these people have forgotten they're going to talk to him someday. And he looks at me, he winks, and he goes away. I'm like, woo. I was like, I got chills all over me. And I, look, I remember looking at his eyes like, man, he's from another place, you know. <laughs> he said some more stuff, too. It's been years now. I should have written it down. But, but uh, so God wants to stretch us through his word. He wants to take us places that we never would go in our, in our own limitations. We talked about courage. We talked about, um, um, you know, um, boldness and and, and really, what it comes down to a lot of it is selflessness. If we get out of our just looking after our own self constantly, we, and we, we position ourselves to be used by God, I mean, great things, profound things, stories will start to happen in our lives uh, that are memorable, that are eternal stories. And, um, you know, I feel like I don't think I want to try to do the whole thing. I, I, there's a second part. I, I really feel like I'm excited about the whole thing, but I think I have to do it two parts. Um, the unimaginable consequences and calamities of not serving the poor. I feel like our nation has already been suffering up on that uh, because of that um, in, in, a, in a, lot, a lot of ways of what we see, the strife and the contention and the, the, the neediness. Uh, but I believe the church is called to be the light, is called to be the solution. Um, and God wants us to receive the benefits of not only being the solution, benefiting others, being a blessing to others, but also, wow, God wants to heap rewards upon us. I mean, I know, I'm going to just share a few things from Sarah and I's life. Um, you know, we've been able to, to, to do things and receive blessings and benefits. Um, you know, we, might, we might not have the biggest salary in the world. I'll put that out there, okay? But, man, we, it doesn't matter. Why? Because... There's invitations and blessings, and if we seek first the kingdom, uh, all these things are added. Everywhere you go, someone's adding something to you. Hey, you need this, you need that, you need a plane flight, you need a place to stay. You know, it's just, and, and, and why? Because I believe we just position ourselves to serve the Lord, but also, watch this, to serve the poor because it's important to the Lord. And I believe God's trying to raise up a church that actually takes his word serious and goes, you know what? There's people we're called to touch in this life that will never be touched unless we get out of our box, our kind of man-made boxes, and, and are inspired and, and motivated and, and, uh, and um, what's the word, propelled by the word of God into new places, um, places that we normally wouldn't go. I remember the first time we started going into to, to nursing homes kind of blew my mind. Just like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, you, we forget in this life what sometimes the end of life can look like and how needy humans can become. And, and watch this, how lonely and forgotten humans can become. And it doesn't have to be that way. I, and I know, like, my mom and my sister, Celeste, they started a Bible study that went on for, I don't even know, like 12 years, uh, a Bible study in the nursing homes. And they saw many people, you know, that were religious all their life. And here they are at the, near the end of their life where they never knew Jesus until they actually had someone just sit with them, open the Bible, and say, no, you can actually have a real relationship. You don't just, just say, well, I went to church, you know, you know. But no, you can have people that were like hanging on the edge of eternity, elderly, and still not even having a clue really about relationship with Jesus and so there's so many places that we can go. We can stand in the gap. I know Wendell, he did a, I love hearing his stories. He served the homeless for, for many, many years and then wrote stories. He wrote down their stories. Like you got a book or you got, you know, a series of stories that were put out for many years. And uh, they're treasures, guys. We, we, we want to sometimes just, uh, you know, move on to the next religious thing. And, the, and the, I'm telling you, I'm kind of giving you a break by not diving into the next part t today because it gets intense. It's like it's the, the, the calamities and the, 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 the curses of, of 
just being religious of not being the real thing are, are just actually overwhelming. So it's, and I feel like we want to camp out for a moment here this morning on the benefits and, and how God sets us up for blessings and how he wants to, to change your life and um, um, through just taking these baby steps. Sometimes they're just the baby steps. I remember I used to tell people, hey, who here knows how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yes. Like, everyone goes, yeah, yeah, I know. All right, you're in, man. You can, you can be a blessing. You can be part of the outreach. You can, you can help someone. And I believe that uh, if the church could see how basic and humane, if I can say that, humane, the gospel really is of just loving our neighbors, ourselves, and and how it's just standing in the gap where we see a gap, whether it's a, a nursing home or a, a prison, a juvenile, a, a friend across the street, a family is melting down, uh, you know, wh- wherever it is. How many people can, can any of us go through a week without seeing needs like humanity in in crisis? Right? It's all around us. Now we can't do it all, but we can do something. You know, there's trailer parks that just need someone to go start a little <laughs> kids program, you know. Fatherless kids everywhere. I mean, it goes on and on. I don't want to overwhelm you, but I want to put out there that why not get creative? Why not uh, allow God to speak to us and say, God, would you give us ingenuity and creativity on how to impact and bring transformation in this life? Or we could visit those who are lonely. We could stand in the gap between the living and the dead. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. One thing I want to put out there is we think we, we sang a beautiful song about harvest that the Lord desires and, and uh, is worthy of his harvest, of the souls brought in for all of eternity into his family. But one of the statistics that we need to understand about the harvest of the world, the globe, the seven and a half billion people that are on the planet right now, is that half of that population is like 21 years old and younger. Like, we got tons of kids, tons of teenagers that are waiting for someone to come. Huge people groups that have not known even the story of the name of Jesus and we get to be the, the light. We get to be the light that they'll see in this life. And the, Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give praise to our Father in heaven. So he connects light with good deeds. He says, what is our light? It's not just an orb around my head. <laughs> it's good deeds. It's, it's actually love in action. And they're going to give praise to the Father because the compassion that came from your life. One last thing that the Lord showed me years ago that I believe is, has begun now. And we get to be part of it. We get to ride it. As he showed me a tidal wave of compassion that would come and wash the earth and sweep millions into the kingdom. But it would come from, it would, it would go to the lowest places. Water always goes to the lowest places first. And, uh, Remember how the Lord says, hey, my table is not full. My name, and he, and, and the, the master has set a table, banqueting table. And he says, wait a second, this, this isn't working. It's not full. And he says with, with urgency and even with anger, it says, go to the poor and the lame and the blind and the crippled. Go get them and fill my table. Go to the highways and the byways. He tells you where you're going to find that last day harvest to fill the table because it's not full yet. He says specifically with urgency and even with, he says with, I find it interesting, he says with anger, he's upset at this situation because most people have excuses. They're like, no, I'm good, you know. But he says there's some people I know we can fill these tables with. It's the poor, the broken. He says, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Then he says, go out to the rural places. So let's just take a moment and let's 
ponder these things, the blessings, but also the, the beauty of this mandate that we've been given. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that I do see that wave rising up. I see a generation that's embracing justice and mercy, compassion. It's no longer the love of most growing cold, but we see the fire has begun, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, you left us an example to follow, Lord. The Lord spoke this to me years ago when we began to serve in the inner city here. He said, if we serve the poor, we will speak to kings. If we serve the poor, we will speak to kings. And I've seen the Lord open authority and influence in nations that I don't think I could have ever been put in those positions, those places, without just humbling myself and saying, God, I humble myself to obedience to your word. And then doors began to open. Lord, help us to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as John the Baptist said. we could, that fruit of repentance is that we would share and be fair with our fellow men. Lord, would you remove selfishness? Thank you, Jesus. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come breathe upon us this isn't something we do in our own strength this is something we receive the seed the word of God as a seed in our hearts and good and noble hearts and God begins to water it and it grows into something beautiful starts to produce fruit